Hi everyone, welcome to episode 80 of the Startup Playbook podcast. My name is Rohit Pagava, and each week I interview successful founders, investors, and subject matter experts on how they got started, the strategies they use succeed, and their advice to current and future entrepreneurs. My guest for this podcast is Ben Fisterer, the Australia Country Manager for Square. Prior to joining Square, Ben had extensive experience within the corporate sector. He was part of the team that launched Jetstar in Australia, and during his time at NAB, he ran one of the world's first mobile payment pilots. Ben was also the head of innovation and emerging products at Visa, where he led the innovation strategy and emerging product implementation across new payment solutions and channels, including the growth of Visa PayWave in Australia to become one of the world's largest contactless markets. Ben then left his corporate career to start his own startup before receiving the call to lead Square's expansion into the Australian market. Founded by Twitter founder and CEO Jack Dorsey, Square allows its diverse users to simplify acceptance of payments via a combination of hardware and software. We covered a lot of topics in this interview, some of which include how to transition out of a corporate career, launching into new markets, transitioning across the different stages of scale, marketing and branding to non-technical users, and the two things that Ben looks for in new hires. Without further ado, here is my interview with Ben Fisterer. Hi, Ben. Welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast, and thanks so much for taking the time to be on the show today. Absolute pleasure. Thanks some technical difficulties trying to get a camera to work. <laughs> Correct. But um, Ben, for, for those people that may not be as familiar with you or your background, do you want to share a little bit about your story and what got you here today? Yeah, sure. Um, started on a uh, probably a fairly familiar route a lot of people do out of university and went to work for blue chip organisations and then sort of gravitated towards management consulting and did that for a number of years. Um, kind of got sick of pretending I knew what I was talking about. Uh, so I wanted to go and work in industry and was really privileged to be part of the team uh, that helped grow from launch uh, Jetstar Airlines. Um, so for me, that was a massive eye opener and I got to see what scaling a business can be like and be around some pretty uh, pretty strong leaders. Uh, so that was great. Uh, and then suddenly during that one of the initiatives I worked on uh, was to do with payments and cards and what have you. So I started gravitating towards that and then kind of got stuck slash uh, angled towards payment innovation. So I was in that for a number of years. So I um, worked at NAB and uh, they helped basically run one of the first mobile payments pilots uh, ever run, uh, kind of put that idea together and scaled it. Uh, obviously a little bit ahead of its time, so contactless wasn't deployed much, but then started to, uh, looking after convincing the bank to do EMV chip technology, contactless and what have you. Went from there to run innovation at Visa, did that for a number of years, mostly looking after the deployment of PayWave and growing contactless in Australia. Uh, after that, kind of got to a point where, you know, the whole big corporate lifestyle wasn't really suiting me very well, so always had a scratch. Um, I wanted to, always wanted to scratch a niche in terms of starting my own business, so I uh, did that for about a year and a half. And then got a phone call for this gig, and uh, obviously on paper when I heard about it, it's the ultimate job for me. So made the big decision, but also an easy decision to start and uh, help to set up Square in Australia. And I've uh, been doing that for, I think it's almost four years, about three and a half years now. So, uh, so you know, obviously you want to come back to some of the experience you've had both in corporate and uh, and obviously with, with Square too. But... Um, I guess you kind of started off with, with talking about how you, you went down the, the fairly common path of going to go and work at sort of large corporate blue chip companies, um, but you did eventually make that decision to, to jump out. And I think there's, like, I have so many discussions with people that kind of go through that similar sort of vibe of, you know, we thought that this was a path and now I'm unhappy, but, like, now I don't know what to do or, or how to how to um, take that next step or, or that leap into, into doing what I really want to do. Was there, was there anything um, in particular that helped with your decision-making or how did you sort of approach that that process or that particular step in your in your life? Sure. I mean, all the roles prior to that, probably the previous four or five, no, probably seven years, were all about, I hate the word entrepreneur, but the, um, working on innovation within corporate. So I had to... I always found initiatives that were good and really sort of um, allowed me to have a work environment I enjoyed, but then they're always short-lived because you deliver it and then going back to square one and starting again with the corporate is very hard. So, yeah, uh, when I was at Visa, I you know it was a great company to work for and it got that to that point, paywave to that point where it was, you know, really you know, massive market being Australia and for contactless. Uh, and realised at the point in my career that, you know, as we all do when we start getting a few years under a belt at Blue Chips, you start getting paid really well uh, and you start having a thousand reasons why you shouldn't do it. Uh, but I knew ultimately I wanted to do it. So um, I couldn't work out how to do it, so I just did it uh, and literally quit from one day to the next. So I went from a relatively high paying salary to zero, a very supportive wife at the time. <laughs> um, and, yeah, I just basically 
said to myself, I'm going to do it. There's a thousand reasons why I shouldn't do it. Only one reason why I should, and it's because I want to. So uh, let's do it. Uh, and got started and had that amazingly liberating and petrifying experience of opening your laptop on the first day, on the following Monday, and having that realisation to go, you know, whatever happens from here is up to me and there's nothing to fall back on and there's no other people or no sort of general momentum within a company that I can just ride along. Uh, it's just what I do from here for. So for me, that was empowering. Sure. Uh, you know, something that you mentioned was, uh, you know, you're on a large salary and I think from... from uh, from a lot of the conversations that I have from people that are in their early 20s, a lot of it is based around I don't have the funds to be able to take that leap because my runway isn't that long. But I think from the other perspective, your opportunity cost is so much higher when you are in a really high paying salary to yep. suddenly go from that to, to zero as well. Um, uh, again, what, what was for, I guess for anyone who's kind of going through that situation at the moment, do you have any advice in terms of how to, how to approach that or how to deal with that? Uh, when I quit my job, you know, it was something that I was looking forward to for the longest time. And then I yep. quit. I'm like, oh, shit. Yep. I've got six totally. weeks to change my mind. Like, you know, <laughs> am I making the right decision or not? But, um, you know, again, is, is there any sort of advice that you, that you can give to, to anyone that's going through that at the moment? Um, I mean, obviously, the risk of getting very philosophical. Um, I think uh, just have the guts of your conviction to do it. I think ultimately I said to myself, it doesn't work out and however long I spend on trying to make it work you can always go back. There are always corporate jobs. Um, I had the belief that trying to start your own business would add to your CV. If you wanted to go back, I kind of didn't want to go back, so I kind of doubled down and made sure it worked and really sort of put a lot of effort into it. But yeah, just go through with it, try it. It's not the end of the world, and as I said, it, it is a hard thing to do, but um, just take that first step. But once you take it, you've, got, you've taken the first step literally. So uh, yeah, just have that conviction to give it a go. Because the longer you wait, the harder the decision becomes. You know, lifestyle changes, you might start a family or you might get a mortgage or whatever. So it's never gonna get easy to do it. So just do it when the, when the time's right for you and yeah, take a leap. Um, so, so on that, uh, so as you mentioned, you kind of had your own business for a little while and then you got a call. Yeah. to come in and, and join Square. Um, again, what was, that, what was that sort of like? Because I assume that you know, a lot of people make the, the decision or that leap with a particular vision of what they have in mind and, and what that will look like multiple years down the line, potentially. Um, but then you were suddenly sort of, you know, I, I assume kind of offered with a, uh, a fork in the road. Yep. Um, again, like any, uh, just really curious to understand what was your sort of decision making process and was it difficult for you to, to give up the, the business that you had started to, to join Square? Yeah, it was a funny one. It was kind of ended up being one of the hardest decisions I've made, but also one of the easiest. Um, so um, I'd gone through that initial, and the first six months of starting a business is just ridiculously hard. Um, I kind of sadistically liked it, but um, it was very, very hard. So the following six months started to see, start seeing traction, and you start understanding the direction you're going. So I was kind of through that early phase. Um, but yeah, I got a I got a call from a, a recruiter, and Square was sort of confidential at that point in terms of the plan of considering Australia. Um, so they didn't say who it was originally, and I I normally like helping out recruiters because I think it's a hard gig to have, and I know the industry quite well and people within it, so I point them in the right direction. Uh, and but I kind of got sick of it in terms of when you are trying to grow a business, you get very distracted by these calls and these different roles. So I said, listen, I can't can't chat about this, sorry. And they said, oh, listen, wouldn't you change for any role? And I said, well, if it was the ultimate role, and they just, they said, well, describe what that would be. And I just said some key metrics like, you know, you know, autonomy to build a business the way I want to build it, um, you know, a great leader, fantastic products, um, et cetera, et cetera. And they kind of, the recruiter kind of chuckled and said, listen, I think you should uh, listen a little bit more. And then I did, and, you know, they weren't very good at keeping it discreet, but they said, oh, listen, I can't tell you who it is, but it's a well-known uh, tech founder in the social media um, uh, circuit, but also who's gone into payments. So obviously I knew who it was straight away. And, and for me, Square had always been uh, like the number one company that I um, not only admired what they were doing in the early stages, but uh, yeah, I think they had amazing runway for success. So uh, yeah, it was an absolute no-brainer uh, to take the step there. But it was hard as well. You kind of you put a lot of personal investment into starting the business, and it wasn't anywhere near where I thought it was going to go. So, but yeah, it was easy. And once it started, it was definitely the right decision. So uh, from, from what I understand, uh, Square launched officially about two years ago, two and a bit years ago in Australia, but uh, you actually joined them and were the first person here four years ago. Is that Yeah, right? so I think, uh, well, the way it started was, um, so once I came on board, it was a little bit shuttling between San Francisco and Australia and kind of looking at the strategy to see whether it would work, and there was still a lot of work that had to be done. Uh, Square's a very complicated, um, as it should be, but a complicated model. Obviously, we've got, we've got uh, hardware and software, 
and when you're doing a, a business that has both those components, there's an incredible amount of work, and then you overlay that with payments and innovation and just every other challenge you'd have with starting a business. It's quite a complicated way to get started. Um, so our, what we would call in, in business C-level executives are an amazingly supportive uh, group of talented individuals, so they gave me a little bit more of a realistic runway to get started. Um, so yeah, and then we eventually launched, after about a year and a bit, we launched um, some of our first few products, but they were just helping seed the market and getting our free point of sale out there, starting to understand the, the community we were trying to enter. Um, but the two year anniversary is based on when we first launched payments, which is obviously a key part of our platform. Um, but yeah, that was actually two years ago to yesterday, so yeah. Oh wow, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> um, so. So I guess again, one of the one of the assumptions I, I imagine would be, you know, you've got a big name brand, you've got Jack Dorsey behind behind the product. It must be so easy to take this hmm. to market. Um, I, I guess what what were some of the challenges of, of initially, uh, I guess, forming that strategy as well to, to enter the Australian market and um, actually rolling that out and and building that here. Sure. Um, yeah, it, it is definitely a misconception that uh, rolling out, I guess, or deploying a, a well-known tech company in a new market, an easy thing. As I touched on, we are a different um, product. I mean, a lot of businesses are either online platforms or uh, mobile-based systems where you're probably more deploying a sales capability and a marketing capability. But Square has, you know, hardware and software, so it's everything. And it's um, it's logistics to deploy. You know, we sell via retailers, so massive partnerships. Uh, we're in the payments and the financial services space, so it's a lot of regulation. Uh, it's a lot of working with local network providers, so making sure we plug into the payment infrastructure. So a lot of heavy lifting goes in to get started, along with um, the basic requirements of starting a business. So I, I definitely can see that you know going out there and starting your own business has a very unique set of challenges, and some of those facets I didn't have to do, obviously. Um, but it then came with a whole new set, which uh, was somewhat unexpected to me, but obvious in hindsight. Uh, but you've obviously got a lot more, uh, I guess, onus on making it work because you've got a bigger brand behind you and a lot more importance. And this was our sort of next foray into global growth. So a very competitive, um, advanced market for payments. So Square had to get it right. Um, it's a lot of complexity there, but you know, ultimately uh, you're also starting a new business. And if we want to scale at the, the rate that we were planning to, a lot of things had to go right, as well as those basic infrastructure pieces. So yeah, as per any business that's scaling fast, making sure you hire the right people, making sure you get the basic premise of you know, a really viable, uh, proactive, high growth culture in place, you get your systems in place, and just start moving very, very quickly um, is critical. So I mean, there's obviously the analogy of building the plane after you've taken off is a little bit like that. Um, so making sure that, you know, we're getting those basic place, pieces in, in, in place, but we, we keep changing. Uh, and because it's a high growth company, the environment and the requirements change really, really quickly. So it's not just, oh, yeah, I've learned how to launch it, I know how to do it and just sit back and grow it. It has to constantly change. So, yeah, I, it, it definitely wasn't easy, uh, but it certainly was a lot of fun. It, was there any, or, or do you utilise any particular processes to to track sort of learnings or iterations of things when you're moving that quickly as well? Um, because I imagine when you're sort of head down and focused on on growing very very quickly, it can be hard and, and things can get missed. Uh, is there any process that you've utilised to to make sure that you're um, adjusting or pivoting your strategy where where required? Uh, not really. I think I had a very strong philosophy in starting that um, I think what I learned through going from blue chip to my own business and then to this is that really basic realisation that when you're at a, a big corporate, probably 80% of your work is internally focused uh, and 20% is actually out there selling or, or growing or talking to customers. And obviously when you start your own business, 99.9% .9 of it is outward looking and very little inward. Um, so I think we, I just sort of aimed, and this is more philosophical than an exact metric, but uh, 20% internal, 80% external to get going. So the one thing I was very strong and still am to this day with the team, um, and it probably goes against my, my background of a bit more structured approach to things, but I've learned that it kind of works in the environment as it is, is to focus on just doing things, get out there, talk to businesses, talk to sellers, grow the business, work with your colleagues, keep going. Uh, if you start being too internally focused too early, um, you're just taking away your opportunity to grow at scale at an early stage. There is definitely phases you get to where you have to start amping that up a bit and make sure you're tracking whether it's your sales funnel and your metrics and your learnings and things like that. We're starting to probably get to that phase now. We're starting to do a little bit more analysis on what we're doing and what's not working. But uh, I back my team to take their gut feel. They're a talented bunch. So early days is 
don't waste time looking internally. Uh, don't waste time documenting too much. Just keep going. Uh, make sure you share everything you learn. So. Um, really curious to know what was what was I guess one of the more unexpected learnings that you picked up of of taking Square from zero to to what it's like now. In market. Uh, that's a very long answer. That one. <laughs> um, no, I'm I'm definitely um, open to saying that you know I learn a lot all through that phases, and I think uh, every single day y- you learn. Um, as I said, it changes so quickly. So what was right when I was the only person here um, through to having five, through to having 10 and heading towards 40 now, um, it changes so quickly and that dynamic changes so quickly, you just have to keep keep moving. Um, so for me, being able to change and recognise change, I think a lot of uh, either managers, CEOs or founders probably think what they've done in the first phase was right for the second phase and just stick to their guns and that's where they can become undone over time. Um, and yeah, I think I have to recognise that really early to say, right, it's time to change. It's time to be a little bit more rigorous or it's time to take weight processes or vice versa. So um, a lot of learnings there. Um, I've learnt that deploying new products in financial services space in Australia is ridiculously hard. <laughs> um, wouldn't advise it to anyone. Um, but it's also an incredibly fun process as well. And I think a space that Square's committed to thinks, well, we, we think it needs a lot of change and we think it needs a lot of competition. But um I think we have a very well-established industry um, with some you know, very, very big incumbents. So uh, over the years, the systems have evolved where the industry is somewhat self-regulatory, so um, it, as it should be, you know, making sure that the system is robust, safe and secure. But that's okay for you know, a set of incumbents and when new companies come along, uh, it doesn't work so well. Uh, so yeah, I've certainly learnt that, and I, have, and I definitely feel for, it's a very generic term, but fintech companies, Australian fintech companies, uh, it's hard. It's really hard. And it's a really multifaceted, complex industry. So, um, yeah, you have to be uh, very strong. Uh, you have to be very, very persistent. Uh, you have to just keep going, stick to your guns. So a lot of learnings in that space too. As, as you just touched on, uh, you know, there's so much innovation that's going on in, in the payment space at the moment. Um, I guess what's, what's your view on what's currently happening and, and what the future of sort of payment innovation is uh, in Australia and, and I guess more broadly globally? Uh, and also, um, again, you kind of touched on this as well, there just seems to be so much competition. And so how do you operate or kind of define your role in a, in a competitive market? Um, yeah, I think in trying, first of all, first party question and looking at how f- or financial services is changing, um, I think we're really privileged as Australians being as businesses or consumers or just you know um, people that watch the industry. I think we have the most advanced payments market in the world, um, which is really, really exciting for everyone involved with it. Um, you look at things like contactless, um, you know, biggest market in the world by penetration. Um, you know, we do events in Australia where 97% of transactions are contactless and very few markets could come anywhere near that. So that's very exciting. Um, in terms of where it's going to go, I think there's probably two facets I think about. One, there's been a lot of focus over the years of the actual point of interaction whether that be an EMV, a chip card transaction or a contactless transaction, I think we're going to move away from that and actually saying what, what else supports a payment. So the reason there's so many massive companies involved with financial services, it is the data behind it is just the most powerful data set around. Um, and obviously for different reasons, different companies want a piece of that and want to have a look at that. Um, so making sure I think um, yeah, different businesses keep growing in that space is not going to stop. There's no doubt about it. Um, so having once the data is is captured, no matter what you're doing or what sort of business you are, what you do with it then and how you provide better service and utilisation to individuals and businesses is where the really exciting innovation is going to come from. Um, the obvious question in terms of what will it look like, um, very ironic for a, a hardware-based company to say this, but I mean, ultimately hardware will will start to disappear from the equation uh, and obviously you've seen in many of the movies and different industry insiders pontificating about it but uh, ultimately it can still be a lot more seamless transaction where there isn't device to device so that's that's inevitable future but it's not going to happen overnight and there's use cases where hardware is essential versus not so uh, it's going to be really fascinating to see that part of the industry change. Um, in terms of competition, um, it's funny, it's a really innovative space um, but it needs more competition. So I think particularly the big banks have done an incredibly good job of innovating. The products and services they offer are fantastic. 
Um, but there still needs to be sort of fresh blood in the, in the industry and making sure new companies are coming in and offering what I think more niche services as well, um, not just an overlay service which is going to completely disrupt everything, but providing better utilisation to smaller groups over time. So I think there'll be a lot more change in that. And you see that coming through um, with different companies in Australia. So. Fantastic. And again, sort of one of the things that you touched on earlier was some of the changes that took place for, for Square internally from like five to 10 to, to now about 40 people. Uh, and it's something that I've kind of learned from different businesses as well is that the problems never really go away. They just change True. and they seem to escalate <laughs> over time. Mm. Um, I guess what, what, are, uh, what have been some of the, the changes um, in, uh, in the team and, and in the way that you work? And I guess also your role uh, from the very early days, sort of four years ago to what it's like now. Um, yeah, I think I, I kind of come from a background where I like getting my hands dirty and being involved with the product, and that's what always you know used to excite me about um, different jobs I had, and particularly around around payment. So, for me, a big learning from one to where we are now is to step back. Um, I've obviously been personally involved with the hiring process, which I probably put on the the most important part of my role to get the right talent in the door and make sure I provide an amazing workplace for them. Uh, but the ability to stand back and trust other people's judgment is a key one. Um, I kind of went into the role willing to do that more, uh, but it's still quite hard. You know, when you've had your hands on most of the things that you've kind of built and then team members come in just to step back more and more, uh, and that never stops. Um, so I think the phases we're going through now is just I keep moving back and empowering the team to make decisions and do the hard work. So, um, yeah, and I, the way that I've hired people, I hire people who are a bad term, it sounds very American, but they're basically jets or little superstars that are you know, really ready to do a great job. So if I've hired that type of person, if I'm not creating an environment for them to prosper, it's just counterintuitive. So making sure definitely I get that part right. Uh, I'd be really curious to know how do you, how do you test for that? Is, is, there, is there something that you look for? Is it a gut feel? Is there a particular sort of test that you have? Is it an indicator of things that they've done in the past? What, what are your sort of qualifying factors for that when, when deciding to, to hire someone? Uh, yeah, I, I, probably an area I've changed a lot as well in, in the way I look at it um, through trial and error. But I look at a CV to obviously, as everyone does, to use that as have they got some form of background? There's something in there that sort of piques my interest to have a chat to them. Um, but once I'm sitting with them and I strangely, I do the first interview. That's uh, the way I like doing it at the moment. It's probably not a scalable approach to it. Uh, but the way I do it at the moment still... Um, and I just talk to the person and get to know them a little bit better. I don't really care what they did in the past, no offence to what they did. Um, but I'm kind of looking for a couple of things, uh, and it's really, they're really obvious, but they're really hard to tease out in a structured interview. But I'm looking for, obviously, people that are smart, which sounds obvious, but really hard to uh, interview for. Um, but I think the way a conversation goes in a free-flowing interview, you can kind of start getting a sense of that person, um, how they're adapting to a conversation. Um, but the other part I look for, which is... Um, this is not supposed to be a negative, but I look for people who have kind of got a chip on their shoulder and mm. that's a positive thing I see. So whether they're early on in their career and they're kind of hit some glass ceiling for whatever reason and they're not being able to move through their career to the speed they want to, uh, they're amazing assets. Um, or on the flip side of that, you're getting someone which is similar to me um, where you've been in blue chip corporate environment and it doesn't suit you and you're kind of being held back and you want to change. So those two things I'm looking for. Um, I think the mid middle part is probably uh, the people in the middle aren't the right fit. So so for me, my first interview is all about culture. And it's yeah. all about just understanding where they're at, where their headspace is at and whether they'd be a right fit uh, and vice versa. So it's a pretty relaxed uh, sometimes a little bit kooky and philosophical conversation with some people. Um, but I think that's the way I kind of need those people which are really self-driven. Yeah. Uh, so funnily enough, something Caitlin and I were talking about before we, we turned on the mic was about culture um, and, and specifically at Square. And so uh, y y from my perspective, you know, I've, I've been doing the podcast for, for 18 months now and it's been amazing to see how different people have different approaches to, to things. And so, uh, you know, certain people try and fit uh, individuals into the culture that's already existing. Other, uh, I think Duncan Anderson from Adrolo spoke about how the culture evolves over time and how you're looking for people to add to that and, and bring something different. Um, again, w I'd just be really interested to, to find out where do you kind of sit across that scale of, of cultural fit? Do you look for someone that, that kind of fits to the team or, or bring something a bit different? Uh, a bit of both, definitely a bit of both. Um, I think because the company changes and the environment changes, you do need to evolve and keep 
bring different types of people in. Um, I think for me, culture, I just I, I kind of cringe when I hear the word culture, and I know I say it a fair bit when I talk to people, but it's such an overused word, and it, to your point, it's a really good one in terms of some people try to overlay a culture onto a workplace, other people try to build it. Um, I, I don't think you can do any of that. I think ultimately culture is about, it's just human beings uh, interacting and working together. So I think if you get the input right, which are the right people um, with those similar values, um, the culture will emerge. Now, again, we're all learning every day in culture, and as I said, our culture is kind of changing by the day. Um, but there's basic tenets that I kind of look for in people, as I talked about before, to make sure they're not only smart, they're not only driven, but they're also humble people. So I think if you kind of get a balance of that, which is often hard, um, the culture creates itself. So I don't really know, I don't think I can define it and say this is what we stand for. Um, I think at best, if you're a really strong uh, leader, and it's probably I'm looking at external people more than myself here, but people that can actually set that northern star and say these are some of the basics and I live by them, uh, so it's not, I don't believe you write them down or, you know, you make sure everyone believes them or anything. It's just, this is what I think we believe in. This, this is the way I'm going to act to different people. It's like transparency and fairness and things like that. Um, and then it starts to emerge. And I think with Square, for example, we've got such a strong mission of what we're trying to do. Um, and we really believe Australian businesses uh, are an incredible bunch of businesses that need what we're building and will appreciate what we're building and we, we believe our products or services are not only fair, um, they actually help small businesses compete against big businesses. So, um, yeah, for us that's kind of the backbone of our culture and from there it's just putting good people together on a similar mission and just try to treat each other really well. Um, and so far that's worked and, and people, I think, um, I think enjoy coming to work every day and for me, um, I kind of joke about this, but uh, I've worked a lot of places and I've had that feeling that where you go to bed on Sunday night and you cringe getting up the next day and going to work and I had a lot um, in my past and I've even thought I love jobs but still had that feeling and you know when you come home from work and you can't switch off and you kind of you're running through bad things that happen during the day and that's wrong so if I can create or foster or, or enable an environment where people actually like being around each other I think that that'll flow through with their work and um, I think the performance we've seen we're seeing that so. Um, again, another topic that's come up several times on the podcast has been, uh, you know, especially in the startup space, I think we're, we're very quick to be judgmental in a sense of, of yep. corporates and, and the culture and essentially what you can learn from, from that environment. Um, obviously, you've had such a strong track record and, and experience in, in the corporate space. Uh, what is it that you kind of learnt that you've been able to apply to your own business and, and to Square that's kind of helped you to scale and, and grow the business? Um, unfortunately, I've probably a lot of my learnings have been things I don't like or things that haven't worked. So I think that's why it's worked well for me now. And which which is almost that. as important as, as kind of knowing the things as well, right? I totally agree. And lessons are about getting things right and getting things wrong. So there's no doubt. Um, so I said I was lucky enough to work on projects or initiatives in, in bigger companies, which are really exciting and, and innovative. Um, but I also realized that it's possible to get it done, um, like convincing a big corporate to do a particular piece of innovation or move a particular way. You can do it, but it comes at a massive cost. And you probably sacrifice longevity to do that. Um, so I think uh, when starting the starting Square here, I took many different pieces of companies and environments I didn't like and just made a pledge to myself, not a literal one, but to make sure those things don't come through early and try to stop them or recognise them when they're happening. Because I know, I know how I felt during those environments so I don't want them to be here and I don't want them to impact people or hinder our organisation because via inertia any small company will become a big bureaucratic company at some point right so we're obviously not there yet uh, but look for the signs and try to stop it or delay it and make sure the culture keeps going in a particular direction that avoids that um, but yeah things that I've tried to avoid um, uh, the internal external balance is a, is a key one um, uh, bureaucracy process and that just keep that out of the company for a very very long time and just keep it very fluid and very workable um, transparency something square globally is really strong on to make sure that is I mean early early on when I first started square literally every every meeting or email or something went to the whole company the board minutes went to the whole company literally everyone um, that and that in the early stages the transparency shocked me like everything was there um, you know a CEO does a very strong 360 degree review and very open with uh, his findings from that and that just 
kind of bleeds in a positive way through the organisation. And, and yeah, I think if you can instil some of those basic premises, I think you're doing well. I think the the whole kind of transparency thing and, and a point that you touched on earlier was uh, I think it's very hard to build a culture, especially as a leader, if you don't lead by example. I'm trying to remember the name of uh, of the person whose video I saw recently, but uh, but they were talking about how they tried to hold a meeting at 9 a.m. about how everyone was coming in late, and they were 10 minutes late to that meeting because they got stuck in traffic. Perfect. And then someone came in and spoke to them afterward and said, like, you know, you don't understand that you telling everyone that they have to be here at a specific time and you not being able to, to do it yourself um, it doesn't breed a, a strong culture within the team and, you know, it doesn't make that as important. And so the... Uh, the, the way that you lead and showing by example is critically important, I think, to, to making that an effective um, team-wide accepted sort of culture or, or way of operating. Yeah, it's a, it's a perfect example, I guess. I think what would be interesting to know, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but what happened next in that conversation? Because I think, you know, as leaders or managers, anyone that professes to think they know everything or have it all structured in a perfectly systematic way is wrong or they're lying or they're bluffing right we're all learning as the most junior person to the most senior person so in that situation I'd be fascinated to know whether that that person just said you know took it on board and sort of was transparent again and said that's a fantastic point you know I've got to learn from that too and we actually see a lot of that in Square where people take that on board um yeah leading by example is it's a tricky one because I mean being on time is one thing uh, it's probably a little bit more controllable um, but it's often hard as well. It's often hard to do particular things the way you always want them done, and you can make mistakes as well, which is the ultimate overriding point. Um, so, yeah, I mean, definitely try to lead by example. Uh, but that said, the funny part is I think definitely some people I've got in my team, you know, they're incredibly strong performers. So um, you often can't you know, lead by example there. Well, they should be and are better at you uh, th- than you at certain things. So uh, I think there's a two-way uh, lead by example there as well so where I see people and behaviors they do and then I'm learning from and making sure that other people are learning from as well so it's yeah the, the days of the leader being knowing everything are, uh, are long gone absolutely um, and again uh, you kind of touched on this a little bit earlier but Square is obviously a hardware and a software player as well um, do you want to talk through some of the complexities of, uh, of running a business that has both of those factors at, at play yeah, absolutely. I mean, hardware, it's basically, I mean, hardware is a very, obviously, it's a physical thing. So it's a very tangible process and any sort of supply chain person or logistics person knows that. But, you know, we are manufacturing cutting edge technology um, that is, that's being designed in our in, in San Francisco and some of our um, other offices, being manufactured in various countries and then being shipped. Um, and so these are, these are very secure, high tech, Um, deployments of pieces of hardware so to making sure that all works lands on our shores gets distributed to our partners to our retail partners to our distribution center then making sure that when a small business wants to start their business that they get that device as quickly as they can which is a big part of why we went via a a retail distribution model is like if you you know the it's a funny funnily enough when people start businesses they forget that last part which is the sale Uh, and so they've got everything ready the service product location whatever they're like wow how do I accept payment so being able for them to walk into a a shop and take a product off a hook and walk out and get going um, which is a massive part of our business model Uh, so yeah making sure it's there making sure that it can get shipped out if it if it it needs to get shipped out if it's bought on our e-commerce or on our website Um, but also you know not in a timely not only in a timely fashion but small businesses particularly in Australia can be anywhere they don't have to be we immediately gravitate towards food trucks or markets or or coffee shops but um, the profile, which is a massive part of my learning, the profile of small businesses in Australia is phenomenal. It's so eclectic and so diverse and so different. and The imagination just li- literally has no bounds on what type businesses they are. So a lot of those ones are regional and we're seeing a real strong uptake in different regional areas. So how do we get it to them? How do we get it to them within a short amount of time and obviously within a reasonable cost to us because it's always free? Um, the shipping's free. So a lot of that part of it, making sure supply and demand and all the curves are met. When you're starting, you don't know what your sales are going to be like. So how do you forecast that and how do you adjust differently to ramp up and round, ramp down during seasonal adjustments and high growth periods? That can go on for hours on that part of it. Um, and obviously, we also uh, we kind of have a promise as a company that we take the innovation out of the, the complexity of it, out of uh, the worries of a small business or a growing business or a big business. And so we'll do it for you. So 
a heap of innovation constantly happens at Square. Like when you go to San Francisco and you see some of the new toys that are being built, it's a kid in a candy store type stuff and a really talented bunch. So making sure that we have a strong pipeline of new products coming to, to Australia and making sure they're localised and they're built properly uh, to not only suit the requirements but suit the local requirements. Um, getting all that right, pricing, yada yada, sales and all that sort of thing. And software, uh, yeah, the classic equation is there, making sure that's right. Um, we move very quickly as an organisation. Uh, you don't always get things right, so making sure that we move quickly, we've got talented engineers can adjust really quickly to make sure we get that right. Um, and ultimately overlaying a theory of simplicity and fairness as well. So our products uh, are very complicated, but they're very simple to use. So very advanced, very technical, but um, the people that use it can be from all backgrounds. They can be literally, I don't know how to have a set up an email address, all the way through to I work in tech. Um, so make sure we've got a product that's everyone, easy for everyone to use. It takes a lot of hard work. Um, so a lot of work here goes into making sure that's right for Australian businesses too. Sure. Um, and speaking of that, like you have such a diverse range of uh, range of sort of users that, yep. that would that would use Square. Uh, I mean, my mum runs a small business as well in Canberra. And Does she use Square? Uh, good question. I'm not sure. I have to I have to <laughs> check with her. If not, she she needs she to get on it. She will soon. Yeah. She will soon. Um, uh, so so one of the one of the things uh, you know again a, a massive assumption about about this sort of market is you know they tend to be sort of non technical and so usually I guess the way that you would sort of market or reach them um, would be slightly different to to, to other forms. Um, how has your uh, how has your kind of marketing approach or outreach changed from I guess the early days of Square to I think at the moment you mentioned that, that the retail aspect is is a really big sort of driver for you and I guess again how did you sort of uh, uh, pivot optimize and, and change that over time? Sure, that I mean, that optimization is definitely still just early stages and is happening as we speak and will continue for a very long time. I think it'll it'll evolve and change a lot. But you're exactly right. The first part of your your question is spot on. Where and it was one of the many learnings that we had as well in terms of a Square. A square user, we call seller, um, isn't always just an obvious business. It could be you, it could be your mum, it could be your brother or sister, it could be someone about to embark on their own business, it could be someone that on the weekend sells something at a market, it could be anyone. So you're actually, it's a really challenging marketing exercise because you don't have a single narrow myopic uh, definition of what your seller is that you could then shape a campaign around and shape your channels around. So you've you've actually got to go, okay, we've got to appeal to everyone of every different background, every age group, every regional difference. And it's like, well, that's an impossible marketing exercise. So uh, what we try to do is we have that openness and we try to make sure that our, any of our campaigns are very simple and very clean and very appealing as well. Um, but yeah, change over time. And we've done a lot, a lot of learning in the early stages where we're starting to work out which channels work better. Uh, we're starting to understand how people search for our products. Uh, we certainly understand that a lot of people that search for our products don't know what they're searching for. So anyone that works in digital search, um, search terms aren't immediately obvious of what they're going to look for and then how do we get in front of them. Um, we had a very talented um, marketing team, digital marketing team, both here and over in the US. So you know, our approach to you know, SEO and SEM are a second to none, I think. So do a fantastic job there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a funny balance, our marketing approach to being incredibly advanced, but also being really rudimentary, which is like, we just need to be where people might see us. And I think another learning for us was, um, is that no one would ever have assumed that payments was an impulse purchase. But I think that's what we sometimes are, where, mm. so our philosophy was, let's be at the checkout areas, whether it's office works or, or something like that, or, or at a telco or something like that. So they can, they may not be looking for us, but everyone who runs a business needs to take payments. So uh, we found a massive uptake in that. So um, try to narrow your focus, digital marketing, but be really broad so people may stumble across you as well. How important was, uh, was brand? To, to that as well in terms of just raising general awareness of, of Square? Well, the, the key thing, I mean, we, talking to you, you obviously know you're in a scene that would know Square very well, the, the backstory. Anyone in the strangely titled fintech space uh, definitely knows Square, but as to our diversity of our sellers, they have no, had no reason to know who we are. So we had a massive challenge to get our brand out there. There's no doubt. Uh, but we have 
uh, definitely a not so secret weapon, which is beautiful aesthetic products. Um, so every time a business uses one of our hardware products, it's an ad advertisement for our product. Um, so we get really excited that not only we do it, the, a, a one person business is using us, but many high profile, high volume businesses are using us. A lot of festivals use us, markets use us, coffee shops. Uh, and for us, that's every time a, a buyer comes into their store or to their event, that's a marketing opportunity for us. Um, and our devices look, I drank the Kool-Aid here, but they look beautiful and they at least pique someone's interest because they look different. Um, so that's a massive marketing asset for us as well, which leads to a lot of you know, organic inflow as well. Fantastic. Um, ben, just really mindful of the time. It is Friday afternoon. <laughs> uh, but thanks, thanks so much for coming on the show. For, for anyone that wants to find out more, say hello, get in touch, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, definitely go to our website, so square.com.au, and, and have a look. Uh, we have a very talented local support team who you can call during business hours. Um, yeah, and have a chat to them and just see whether it fits the requirement of your business. Uh, we have a very detailed website as well that provides a lot of information. Uh, and for on anyone that wants to get started with Square, we have a you know, pretty committed sales team that's you know, underway that can chat to you and make sure it suits your business. But you know, ultimately, you know, give it a try. Um, it's not as scary as it used to be getting payments set up and the products we provide beyond just our payments hardware is a really sophisticated bunch of tools to help you run your business better so you know download them for free give them a go uh got any questions let us know but otherwise i uh, hope you enjoy using square fantastic i'll make sure a link to the website is on the show notes ben once again thanks for coming on the show thank you my pleasure thanks for listening to episode 80 of the startup playbook podcast you can find the show notes of my interview with ben along with a curated list of tools and resources for startup founders at startupplaybook.co as always, you can join the conversation through our Twitter account. The handle is at Playbook Startup. Later this week, I'll be back with a new episode of The Hustle. In the meantime, don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with our latest interviews. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you at the next episode.